this point we say welcome to those who are watching on the internet and uh, as everybody here is welcome so is, uh, are you welcome as well and maybe one day you'll be in the vicinity of Perry and you'll be able to pop in and join us for real. Let's spend a few moments now in prayer. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that we may come with that oneness of spirit. We pray we may come with that oneness of spirit for the, the whole Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May we come with that oneness of spirit, each one of us, with that desire to come before you, recognizing that only you are the one who can make the difference in the lives of each one of us here today. We pray that you speak to us, reveal the things of yourself, and the things that may be in our lives that are a distraction. We pray they may be cleared away, that we may have room only for you. And so we pray this in your name's sake. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask Jocelyn if she'd like to come bring to us a reading from Galatians 4. Thank you. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively the women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free and she is our mother. For it is written, be glad barren woman you who never bore a child, shout for joy and cry aloud, you who are never in labour, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. But what does scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Amen. Thank you, Jocelyn. I don't know how many of you can remember this far back, but in the 1960s, you remember the 1960s? No? Okay. In the 1960s, there was a young man, was a bit of a philosopher, and so he was traveling his land with all kinds of philosophies. Well, in the midst of his philosophies, he had a he had quite a following of young people. Probably part of that was because, like, unlike most philosophers, he, 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 didn't, uh, he didn't really want any kind of title. He wasn't a professor. He didn't want to know any of that. Uh, so he wasn't kind of the establishment figure. But what a lot of philosophy he would bring out. And to make it easier for the young people, he would put his philosophies to music. That's a wonderful way of kind of conveying a message. We put it to music. Well, he did that. And here is some of the things that he would have said in his philosophizing to music. 
you don't always get what you want. Then he repeated it. You don't always get what you want. And to make sure that it really sunk in, he said it for a third time. You don't always get what you want. But if you try, you might just get what you need. I don't suppose many of you remember that philosopher. He, he just went by the name of Mick, Mick Jagger. And uh, well, there's something in that, isn't there? There is something in that. I want to suggest, though, that perhaps that's not everything. It's perhaps not everything. He has gone so far. But I want to say that perhaps we should be looking, not just uh, if we try, we'll get what we need, but if we wait, we will get the best. We'll get the best if we wait upon God. If we wait upon the promises he has given rather than, hey, I, I know how to do it. I'll do it my way. Uh, wasn't there another singer that said that? I'll do it my way. Well, listen, no Frank Sinatra's here. It is people waiting on God. That we might know the best. That we might know the best. Uh, I was just thinking for a minute, uh, David and uh, Dorothy. Um, remember Der David and Dorothy? Good to see uh, Elizabeth and uh, your husband here today. But I remember David and Dorothy who were here when I first came here. And uh, it was always a pleasure to go and visit with David and Dorothy. And invariably, 10 chances to 1, if I'm visiting, David would speak to me about the things that he remembered when he was in the Royal Air Force. That was, that was his heart. That was his heart. And the places that he and Dorothy travelled to, the places they went, the people they met, that was all important. And the work that David was doing, uh, and in the work that he was doing, you know, he, was, uh, he, he travelled right the way around the country because he had a responsibility of ensuring everything was just right. And if there were changes to made, he was the one that made the recommendations for changes. It had to be the best. It had to be the best. And, uh, yeah, David was very passionate about that, ensuring that things are the best. The best that we could ever have is when we wait upon what God has promised to us, what God's got planned for us. To think about that, to wait and to listen to what my God, our God, is saying. What well, our God is saying. In this passage of scripture that, that Jocelyn read to us, Paul is kind of looking back on some of the things that were there in the history that the people in Galatia would know. Uh, they had that Jewish background and uh, they were kind of kind of tied up with this whole idea that, well, you know, if anybody gets converted, um, they need to go the extra mile and they need to follow the Jewish law. And Paul is saying, well, no, you've got it a bit wrong here. You've got it a bit wrong. And let me show you how you've got it wrong. And so he looked back at some of those things that were there. They knew it. It was in their history. It was in their scriptures. They knew it, it was all there. And the first thing that he speaks about is about Abraham and his sons. Now, Abraham, uh, Abraham had a promise. The promise was that he would be the father of a great nation. That's the promise that God had for him. Now, at this point, he didn't have any children. And uh, the time was going on, and he was getting on in age. But that was God's promise. And God was promising him the son, through Sarah, a son who would bring a great blessing to the nations of the world. Do you know, it took 25 years before that promise became true. But it was God's promise. And it was God's promise that it would come in the fullness of time. 
But 25 years, it's a long time to wait, isn't it? You know, if I promised you something today, uh, I think you get, by the time you got to 25 years, I think probably we think, no, it's not coming. But it's God's promise. And God promises always come true. But they come true at the time that he sets. And poor Abraham is waiting and waiting and thinking, well, maybe God needs a hand here. And so, uh, uh, so it is that we find that he has an older, a son who is older than Isaac because Abraham wasn't able to wait, couldn't wait. And so he took up a, another young lady, a handmaid, and uh, from that came Ishmael. Ishmael. Because Abraham couldn't wait on God's promises. Just waiting a bit longer, I knew she'd come along, but Isaac. And through Isaac, the promises were going to stand true. Through Isaac, the promises were going to stand true. And you know, what strikes me here is that there is a horror that comes from a lack of faith. There's a horror that comes from a lack of faith. In Abraham, I can't wait on you, Lord, I'll give you a give you hand. And what was the result of that lack of faith, of waiting? The result comes with a lot of pain. A lot of pain. We see it right at the beginning with uh, Isaac and, and, uh, and Ishmael. Right at the beginning we've seen that, that uh, bitterness that comes through. The hard words that are said. We see it all because Abraham did not wait. And to this very day we are seeing the results of that lack of faith. Because the descendants of Ishmael is the Arab nation. The descendants of Isaac is the Israelite nation. And I think most of us, if not all of us, are aware. We don't have to wait long before we see something on the news that, that depicts the, the rivalry that is going on there, the people that are injured, the people that, are, that have, have died, all because of that enmity that began from the choices that Abraham made. The choices that Abraham made. There's a horror that comes from a lack of faith. It ends up wrong. It ends in despair. And there is that classic example. And probably we can probably see things in our own lives. Where because we did not wait, because we didn't have that expression of faith, things turned wrong and we were in despair. I, I have no idea who wrote this, but somebody wrote these words. Fear does not stop death. It stops life. Worrying does not take away tomorrow's troubles it takes away today's peace isn't that true isn't that true in faith we don't fear and we know God's life within us in faith the worrying is put aside and we see peace peace I know my mum used to say, you know, worrying never changes anything. Well, in a sense, that's true. Worrying doesn't change anything. Except it makes it worse, doesn't it? It makes it worse. And when we place everything into the hands of God, we see the peace that only God can give. That peace that passes all human understanding and he's given it to us it's there for us he's placed it there for us that we can grasp it and know it in our heart but it takes faith 
It takes faith to remember that. It takes faith to be able to grasp it. It takes faith to be able to move on within it all. Oh, that we might avoid that horror that comes from that lack of faith in our lives. But never mind the horror, you know, Paul goes on to say, look, there's hope. There's hope in Christ. Yeah, I can see all that lack of faith, but there is hope in Christ. And so he quotes, he quotes here from the book of Isaiah. Now, every Jew that's reading this passage knew exactly what he was talking about. So he quotes from Isaiah, and it's Isaiah chapter 54. And it goes like this. Be glad, barren woman. You who never bore a child, break forth and cry aloud. You who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. And just to put that in context, you know, in the ancient East, uh, if uh, it was a, a figure of shame if you never had a child. Now we know better now. But then, in the ancient East, if you never had children, well, there must be something wrong with you. You must have done something wrong. And they could have been a perfect woman. But that's how they saw it. Uh, we, another example would be the mother of Samuel. Had, uh, had no children. And so she went and she was crying. She was crying when Eli saw her. And as she cried, Everything was coming up from her heart. Why was she crying? Because for her, she felt she was in a position of shame within her society. She was in a position of shame because she hadn't had the blessing of children. And so her heart was breaking. Her heart was breaking. And in the midst of that time, she gets her promise. In a year, she'll have a child. And the child came, called Samuel. Samuel. Be glad, barren woman, you who, uh, who never bore a child, break forth and cry aloud. And he's talking about these people, these women, who felt in such despair, felt they had nothing to hope for. And he's trying to say to them, wherever you are, wherever you feel you are, there is hope for you. You may feel that you're at the rock bottom of life, but there is hope that can be for you. And you know, in that passage, it's passage is pointing towards the hope, the hope that you and I can know today. The greatest hope is because we can have hope in Christ Jesus. There is a despair of the past that's here. There's a despair of the past as they see, look, that's how it was. So Paul is saying to the Galatians, listen, you think everything relates to the law? Well, let me take you back to what Isaiah said. Yeah, one of your prophets. What did he say? And he spoke about, yeah, the barren woman is, is someone that can be glad. How can, you be, how can she be glad? She's surely at the rock bottom of society. How can she be glad? But what Paul is referring to here, as he draws that quotation from Isaiah, he's saying, listen, you are barren. Your lives may be barren. You may be spiritually barren. But listen, do you remember what we said about Jesus do you remember the times we spoke about how Jesus came to make you whole? How Jesus came to make you something better than you could ever do for yourself. And you can be glad. Yeah, look at your past. Look how barren you are. And there isn't any fruit that's coming from your life. But you can be glad. You can be glad. The hope that comes in the seed of Abraham is a hope we know today. There is a despair of our past, and we can all look back and we can see in our past the things that will bring us down. 
There is our despair of the past, but there is the dream that we can have of great possibilities. Now, what a dream it is. What a dream it is. Somebody sang, and I'm, for the life of me, can't remember the singer that I should do. I have a dream. I have a dream. Abba? Well done. <laughs> uh, I have a dream. Oh, but listen, we can all have dreams. I, I've had dreams. Uh, some of them I remember, some of them I don't. Some people remember dreams and some people don't. We all apparently have dreams. But it's better to have a dream than a nightmare. It's better to have a dream and to know that there is something great within it. It's better to have that dream that speaks of the great possibilities. And to know the great possibilities we can know. We can know. I used to live in an island in the Hebrides. And in this island is a the biggest house is called Isla House. It was on Isla and a big house. There used to be an Isla Estates, and I, I believe that's all been sold off now. That was part of Isla House. And I remember I had this dream. See, I told you I had dreams. I had this dream on one occasion, and in this dream, I dreamt that our church, we, we had a very small church. My dream was that the church will be of such a state that we will have to take over Isla House. That's really quite some dream, isn't it? Great possibilities. Great hopes. Ah, but it's only a dream, isn't it? It's only a dream. There's a, a man called John Blanchard who was is an international Bible teacher and evangelist. And he was evacuated to Isla from the Channel Islands as a boy uh, during the war. And he sent me a letter saying uh, something of his background and he would love to be able to recapture some of his childhood memories. And so he came across and um, managed to find some of the people that remembered him. It was a great time. And later on in the year, he sent me this other letter. He said, you know, I've come to a particular stage in my ministry and as part of a celebration of a number of years, I, I would like to be able to um, express something here. And so I've got to read booklet. And if you're, if you're able, you might even see it on the back there, just behind Bob, written by John Blanchard. That'll give you a clue because I've forgotten the name of the book. <laughs> Pardon? No, it's not. No. Uh, that's another book that he wrote. Um, so anyway, you, you'll find the book later on. And in this book, um, uh, he's really bringing out something of expressions of faith. It's a testament, as it were, as if shares from God's word. And as he speaks about this book, he tells me the, 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 the prices and what it is for a bulk order. And then as a PS, he says, if it should happen, if it should happen, that somebody was able to um, pay for it all, how many houses are there on the island? And if somebody could pay for it all, would it possible that you could deliver this book to every house on the island as part of my celebration and then he said just a crazy thought well I love crazy thoughts so I wrote back to him and I told him how many houses there were on the island and I said if someone was to pay for it all then yeah we could use that and we could make sure that every home gets a copy of the book. And so that's what we did. We made that, that, that was our project for the year. Every home on the island. One day I was coming back from uh, 
Port Charlotte on the other side of the island. And as I came back, I saw the big house and I thought, Do you know, we promised we were going to every house, but we haven't been to this house. And until we do, have we kept the promise? Uh, we would have avoided it because that's the big house. You know, it's like going to Buckingham Palace and you don't ring the bell of Buckingham Palace. So I thought, well, let's give it a try. I pulled off the road, up the drive, and uh, stopped uh, in front of the house. I rang the bell. Well, surprise, surprise, it wasn't a servant that answered the door. Uh, it, it was a lady, there was a married couple that owned it, an American couple. And the lady, um, the wife, she came to the door. And I explained to her about this booklet and how he lived uh, on Isla during the war. And as part of a, a thank you, as it were, he wants to give this gift to every home on the island. Well, she says, that's interesting. Come along in, we'll have a cup of coffee together. So we sat there and we had coffee. And uh, we had a great conversation. And then she said, if we should ever come to back to the island and you want somewhere to, to have a, a central place where people can come and meet with him, I want you to know my home can be yours. My home can be yours for the day. And she showed me some of the places that were there. And she said, look at this kitchen. It was a huge kitchen with one of these long range uh, uh, stoves. You know, I've never seen anything anywhere else. I've been in some houses and uh, never seen anything like this, except in films. She says, you can use that. If you want to use it for cooking anything, you can use it. You got full use of the house. Well, yes, John did come back. And we did take up that offer. And there we were in Isla House. The whole church, plus those we, we had reached out to and invited, came along. And yes, we did church in the big house. Now, who said dreams don't come true? They do, don't they? I have a dream. I have a dream. And it's good to have dreams. It's good to have dreams, but to in the dreams to recognize that in God there are great possibilities. And in God, those great possibilities can come true. And you know that passage that Paul is quoting from? Isaiah chapter 4. Now, if you looked at the verses that followed on from that, well, it would go something like this. Stretch out the walls of your tent. Do you remember it? Do you know last year, the beginning of last year, each year, the church here looks and uh, prayerfully decides what is an appropriate um, biblical um, uh, text we can have. And uh, that's the one we chose last year. And we never realised how God was going to do it. But he did. He did. Uh, those of you that are looking in on the internet are, are a, a proof of that. Because uh, I know we couldn't fit you all in the building. I'd like to see some of you, though. Stretch out the walls of your tent. See the great things that God will do. When we step out in faith, have that dream. Have that dream. And have it confident that our God is more than able to meet our every need. But thirdly, we need to hold to the promise. We need to hold to the promise. Paul says, now you brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. They've forgotten it. They've forgotten they were children of promise. Paul knew because Paul was the one who spoke to them about Jesus. Paul was the one who led them to Christ. And they made that start in faith. The law was to be put behind them. What they were to rely on is faith, 
trusting Jesus and trusting Jesus alone. And they didn't hold on to that promise. That's why Paul wrote this letter to the Galatians. Uh, it's amazing how many of the letters Paul wrote. Uh, we get uh, blessed by it. But he wrote them because there was somebody who needed to be told, listen, that's not quite how you do it. This is how you do it. You know, that, see how the blessings come from the, those kind of things? Well, Galatians is one of those things. Because they had not held on to the promise. Because they had not held on to the promise. Here comes the message that is for us. You are children of promise, he says to them, just like Isaac. Now, if you have trusted Jesus as your saviour, if you express that faith, forget the religiosity. Forget all the, uh, the hang-ups of the past. Forget what denomination it may be and all the things that go with that denomination. And remember one thing alone, that you are yours, not because of the law. You are the Lord's, not because of the law. But you are the Lord's because you have put a trust in Jesus. And in faith, in faith, he gives to you the promises that really count. He gives it all to you. All to you. And when we come in faith, you know, we are ridding ourselves of all the pain. Remember that pain that was there for Ishmael and Isaac? You remember that pain that's there that's gone through the ages, even to this very day? To rid ourselves of the pain that comes when we're tied up with the past. To rid ourselves of living as if we are in slavery. Uh, they were like that in slavery. We're like that when uh, we've, the world is still there in our, in our heart instead of Jesus. Uh, and we are slaves. We've enslaved ourselves. When we should be ready for freedom. Are we ready for freedom? Are we ready for freedom in our lives? Well, it's yours. It's ours. It's mine. Not because of what we do, not because of what we are, but because of what Jesus is and what Jesus has done and can continue to do in lives that are given over to him, trusting Jesus, coming before him and saying, Lord, I, I, I want to be yours and only yours. And, and, and all those things of my past, I want rid of them. I just want the freedom that's mine when you give it to me. The freedom that's mine when I say, Lord, I am sorry for the things I have done. I look to you for the pardon that you will give when I'm trusting you and you alone. And may we come in such a way as that. It takes a little bit of humility sometimes because we don't want to admit the wrong things we've done. That's part of our humanity, isn't it? We don't want to admit it, and yet we've all got it. Every one of us. Every one of us. But Jesus can deal with it for you and for me. Let's spend a few moments in prayer. Let's pray. Oh Lord and Heavenly Father, oh that we would hold to the promise. The promise you've given. The promise that we can know. Oh that each one of us will hold to your promises. To be able to say as, the, as uh, was in that chorus, holding on to the, about holding on to the promise, standing on the promises of Christ our King, through eternal ages, may his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. And we stand firm at the best. 
as we trust Jesus as Saviour and as Lord. And so we pray this in your namesake. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, let me just say before the um, camera is switched off, thank you uh, to those who have joined us from the internet. Good to have you here. Look forward to having you with us another time. Thank you.